Well, I've always been a non-conformist. When I was a young teenager, I'd head off on a Saturday afternoon after school sport to buy pigeons from Paddy's Markets at Redfern. And the funny thing is, it's actually right here at Carriage Works where I used to come. It used to be Paddy's and uh, they'd sell all different sorts of things, including these pigeons. And I'd head out on the bus and the train for the sole purpose of rescuing these birds from the cramped confines of the cages in which they were being sold from within the markets. And a lot of them were being sold as food to eat. And if not the markets, I'd head out to a pigeon fancier's place and buy some more exotic looking birds that were being bred to compete against one another in pigeon shows. And I guess what appealed to me was the idea of being able to train them to home and allow them to fly freely without the restrictions of the cages. And the idea of this was basically, it, it, it was an idea that made me feel good, but it wasn't at the expense of the pigeons either. And, uh, you know, it was generally when I was supposed to be studying or doing schoolwork, but I found it much more fascinating to build this flock of homing pigeons. And the, the whole process allowed for the noticing of different character traits and idiosyncrasies of the individual birds. It might be something you wouldn't even consider pigeons to have, but living with uh, them in such close proximity and tending them on a day-to-day -day basis, I was able to notice this. I was also able to notice just how much poo pigeons are capable of doing within a confined space, which just so happened to be my parents' backyard. But uh, they were always pretty supportive of my interests. And, uh, you know, my dad had kept pigeons in his childhood and then again into his adult life during my childhood. So I guess they'd rubbed off on me. But by the time Dad had, uh, by the time I start collecting the birds, Dad uh, no longer had his pigeons, and I wanted to recreate the relationship he had with them and build this bird wonderland around me. And um, I didn't see anything wrong with my obsession. It was a distraction that I felt I could justify through what I believed to be a noble purpose. And uh, you know, it was for a good cause and not at the expense of the pigeons. And uh, you know, a sort of symbiotic relationship existed between us where uh, I enjoyed them and they relaxed me and I was, they were able to live in a, an environment that I provided for them and breed and grow in a fairly uninhibited way. And, uh, you know, I guess it was this need... Uh, in a way, I was escaping my own reality by helping them escape theirs and it was this need to escape that we both had in common and in order, I guess, to reach our higher goal or potential, we both need to be set free to fly in our own direction. But obviously it was not going to be uh, something that I could rely on to support myself as, as a career. Um, you know, it just wasn't going to happen, or was it? Well, the thing is, the irony is I still do it. And the trick was I just needed to be able to turn what I initially thought was this escape from reality and be able to accept it as an alternate one. And the thing is, I'm now 34 years old and I work as an avian behaviourist. And although there's not a great call to train a 200-strong flock of homing pigeons, <laughs> there is a call to train people who keep companion parrots as pets in an attempt to better the lives of these animals living in captivity. And people sometimes say to me, you know, when are you going to get a real job, mate? Or, or is this all you do? Honestly, I couldn't think of anything more real or rewarding than being able to affect the lives of these often misunderstood, highly intelligent creatures that have the potential to live for 80 years or more. Um, it's, you know, birds have helped me find my place in life and I sort of feel it's my moral obligation to help them where I can. And uh, to this day, you, you, I'll go to Bondi Junction and those, you know, those pigeons you see hobbling around the streets of Sydney, they've often got... Uh, toes missing or sometimes they've only got a stump to walk on but I'll stop and try and help them and, and take the string off that's caught around their toes or whatnot because I feel pigeons have been the roots in what I teach people and I'll always have a strong admiration and connection to them for that reason. And the area in which I specialise as an avian behaviourist, it's loosely known as free flight and it's basically training a captive bird or a companion bird to train uh, to fly freely in an outdoor environment. And it's based on a bird's natural instincts to form a home range and also their instincts, in the case of parrots, to form strong social bonds with one another. And it generally takes about three months to train a bird for free flight, providing I'm training a bird which I consider to be a blank canvas. It takes one month to establish a rapport with the bird 
The second month, I like to build its confidence up in flying, and I'll do that in an indoor environment initially. And the third month is desensitizing it to an outdoor environment in which I intend flying it in. And when I talk about a blank canvas, I mean a bird that hasn't been exposed to unnatural condition behaviors that are going to affect its overall, um, you know, being able to go out and fly in an outdoor environment. And such things that would affect that would be things like over-socializing with humans or the development of anxieties that they may have formed through their, an inability to fly. Uh, and that's often the case with companion parrots because they're often bought at a crucial developmental time in their life with already clipped wings. And this becomes the accepted way of keeping them without question. But I believe for an, a bird to develop into both a physically and mentally well-balanced creature, it needs to be able to act upon these instincts in a natural way as possible. And uh, flight's often one of these neglected instincts. But uh, through flight, a bird's able to develop confidence, self-confidence, and is able to express itself uh, amongst a whole lot of other things. Um, but I like to call free flight. I like to call it thinking outside of the cage because one, it's exactly that. I'm taking birds outside to an outdoor environment and I'm flying them. And also it challenges the mainstream way of keeping companion parrots. And for me, thinking outside of the cage, it's allowed me to tap into this uh, other dimension of, uh, in a way of keeping birds because you know, if I ha I've been able to develop these connections with bird that's birds that I would have otherwise not have been able to make if I had gone down the straight and narrow, I suppose. But, um, you know, it's when birds don't have the ability to access uh, these natural instincts in the natural way that things can often take an irreversible turn for the worst, and they can develop psychological disorders um, that we often uh, see as inappropriate forms of behaviour, but they're actually appropriate forms of behaviour in response to the inappropriate ways in which we've kept them. Such things as excessive uh, screeching, they may even self-mutilate, which involves pulling all their feathers out. And the other thing they do is aggressive biting. But um, for that reason, we really need to embrace flight and all the instincts that is essence, in essence make up a bird. Um, you know, birds in, in captivity develop their instincts just as they would if they were in the wild. And it's important to be aware of this and embrace it so that we're not going to cause uh, you know, damage to an animal that we consider to be a companion. I recently finished a job that uh, involved training a communal flock of free flight birds where there were 30 macaws, um, 15 eclectus parrots, which now breed in, in a wild environment and then bring their babies back to the aviary. Um, there's eight red-tailed black cockatoos, along with uh, five yellow-tailed black cockatoos, two Amazon parrots, amongst several other species of parrots. And um, it's a unique situation that's never been done before. And it gives me great satisfaction in knowing I've been able to provide these birds with this lifestyle. And they're able to develop as birds in their own right. Um, you know, they're let out in the, from the aviary first thing in the morning. They return home to roost of an evening. but. Um, you know, working with birds in an outdoor environment, it, it, it brings me in touch with the natural world, which I find is important in this day and age, and it helps me gain perspective. Um, you know, I need to be in tune with that natural world in order to do what I do. And I need to know of predators in the area, such as birds of prey and their natural food source in that area, uh, and how they, the birds that I train will be affected once in that area. And I mean, you know, I also need to be aware of weather patterns, how they might affect a bird. And I need to be able to do all this as part of the process in assessing the suitability of the environment in which to fly these birds. And uh, I find it very real and sometimes more tangible than what's often considered to be the real world because it can mean the difference between life and death for these, uh, in the decisions I make for these birds. And uh, I find that very grounding. But. Uh, you know, I needed to have the confidence to embark on this uh, project and take these ri calculated risks with these birds that I'd become so attached to. And I mean, these birds had meant a lot to me. And the people that owned these birds also had to have the confidence in me. Um, my time on the project's now ended, but I know the birds still fly free. And I can only hope that the people that own this marvelous collection continue to do the right thing by them. 
but it's this project that's inspired me to embark on my latest project with Free Flight, and that's the training of a blue and gold macaw named Mango. And Mango's here with us today. So I'd just like to introduce you. Mango. <laughs> Come on, girl. <laughs> Come and say hi. Come on. Don't be shy. Come on, Mango. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Come have a cookie. <laughs> Come on, Mango. Come on, Mango. Come on. <laughs> Good girl. Come on. Beautiful. That's the way. Yeah, she loves the shortbread bickies. First thing in the morning normally. It's been a bit of a wait today. But, uh, you know, with Mango, unlike the uh, flock of birds on the property, which I trained, which was a fairly isolated property, I mean, she, I've trained her in suburbia, and she's, she's a one-off. She's a, an initial flock member, and I intend... Um, getting more when I've saved up enough money, but um, it's had an effect on her social habits and her inclination to want to socialise with people, which isn't hard to do in suburbia, especially considering we live two doors away from the local park. And when Mango flies, I, I, apparently the local vets get 20 calls a week saying there's an escaped macaw flying around Bronte, but anyway, um, she... she, uh, yeah. she oh, it's OK. You want to play on eat cookie? There you go. And anyway, so it engages conversation um, with, with these people. And Mango's got an, an innate attraction to kids. And I'm not sure if it's the screams and high-pitched calls, but she's fascinated by them. It could, could be the fact that the local school kids have a blue and yellow uniform. <laughs> so she might think they're like a little flock of macaws. But whatever it is, it engages this uh, interaction. And they'll often ask me, you know, has she escaped? And what if you don't get her back? And, I get great joy in being able to tell them that, you know, she, uh, she lives an alternate lifestyle. And, um, you know, and they, they love it. But the whole thing is um, she, she, she's doing, living this lifestyle. And I guess she, in, they, when they say to me, has she escaped? I guess in a sense she has escaped. She's escaped sort of a system of preconceived ideas. And in doing so, with a bit of luck, she may have just inspired them into thinking outside of the cage. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>